I wonder why some people think that uh, God enjoys something we don't enjoy. But if we come together, we've got a baptism today. It looks fantastic. Are you pleased? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Some of you will know this, but I'm a great fan of westerns. Um, and the western is making a comeback. All my favourite stars are galloping across the prairie at enormous speed. You know, they speed up those films. Any horse that could run that fast would win the Derby, the Grand National and everything else. But they're, they're galloping across the, the prairie at this enormous speed, chasing the stagecoach or whatever's happening. I enjoy that. I like that. And I'd like to describe a typical scenario that you get in these stories. Now, you have to get into the atmosphere. It's noon. It's hot. It's a small town. It's dusty and dirty. And it's business as usual. Everyone's going about their usual business. Except there's a, an atmosphere about the place. There's an apprehension somewhere. And people are just not quite themselves. And then you hear this sound of a single horse walking very slowly into the town. And a man comes riding on this horse. He's unshaven. He's a sort of dark sort of character, serious. But most of all, and this is important, because you have to notice the little things in films, he has a low-slung gun. Now, for you that are not Western fans, I want to tell you that if you're a cowboy, you don't wear your gun up here, because it takes too long to get your hand up and get the gun out. You have it down there, low-slung. So he's a gunslinger. And he comes into the town, and he ties his horse up outside the Lazy Horseshoe Saloon, and he walks out into the middle of the street and starts walking slowly down the street. A little while later, another man emerges further down the street from the shadows, his gun slung low as well, and they start to face each other and they walk very slowly towards each other. Now, if you're a fan of these films, you will know that certain things happen. This is the point at which, when they're facing off to each other, a child runs out from the side. Have you noticed this? <laughs> runs out into the middle, and a mother runs after the child, scoops it up and runs onto the other side. Who is this child who gets in all these films? <laughs> Where are his parents that allow him or her to do this? I don't know. Another thing that happens, you'll notice, is the barber He's shaving someone and he looks out the window and he sees the two gunmen. And what does he do? He goes to his window and pulls down the blind. Now, I'm not an expert in these sort of things, but I would have thought that a bullet flying through the air would hit a window and go through it and through a blind as well. So unless John Lewis are doing bulletproof uh, blinds, I don't know what he's doing. But it's, it's there. You watch for it. And then something else happens. A man is hiding behind a barrel on this side of the road. And he gets up and he runs across to that side of the road. Now a few moments later, another man from this side of the road runs back over this side of the road and hides behind the barrel. Now what I want to know is what does this man who first ran know that that man doesn't know about being on that side of the road? I don't know. I have no idea. But then you have the confrontation. And there's a blur of hands. Shots ring out. And one man falls dead in the dust. And he lays there. The other man waits for a moment to make sure he doesn't get up. And he blows the smoke from his gun, puts it in his holster, walks back to his horse outside the lazy horseshoe, unties it, gets on and rides slowly out of town. 
and into the sunset. But let's change the story a bit. What if one of them is reluctant to fight? He doesn't want to fight. He's tired of killing. He's been known as the the fastest gun in the West and everyone has sought him out because they all want to challenge him. And he's got to the point where he doesn't want to be challenged anymore. He's sick of killing and all the dying and everything. He wants to leave his reputation behind but he's doomed to spend his life fighting off someone else who turns up to try and kill him and become the fastest gun. But now what's happening? The undertaker has always got a coffin on the ready. Have you noticed that? Loaded onto his wagon, he rides up to the dead man and the dead man opens his eyes, gets to his feet and takes off a bulletproof vest and goes home. You see, he's now free from his reputation. He's free from everything that has gone before. Because dead men have no interest, the new gunslingers. His his reputation finished. Death has taken care of his past. And he's free. No one comes looking for a dead man. Now, did you know that we have a national register in this country for lost dogs, but we don't have a register for lost people? Shows a sort of priority there somewhere, doesn't it? I was listening the other day to a man on the radio who's an insurance man, and his whole job is to check up on people having died, making sure they have died. And I don't mean to say he makes sure they, they, he kills them. <laughs> He's checking up to make sure that it's genuine. You know, we had a case some years ago, an MP called John Stonehouse. Some of you might remember, or you're too young to remember. Uh, If you are, don't talk to me. Um, But John Stonehouse, uh, they found his clothes by the side of the sea and they assumed that he'd gone out to sea and drowned himself because he had all kinds of problems. It was only some while later that they discovered him living in Australia. So he was alive. But people are trying to leave their obligations and their responsibilities behind them. And this is one of the ways they try to do it. Now I'm going to read to you from the Bible. I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 6. It's a version you perhaps haven't come across and it should come up, I hope. We're going to start from verse 1. How are we doing? Oh, there. It's okay. Does it follow that we ought to go on sinning to give still more occasion for grace? See, he's, I'm butting in in the middle of an argument here where he's saying, look, uh, the more people sin, the more it shows how wonderful God is to forgive. So he says, God forbid we do that. We have died once for all to sin. Can we breathe its air again? You know well enough that we who were taken up into Christ by baptism have been taken up, all of us, into his death. In our baptism, we've been buried with him, died like him, that so just as Christ was raised up by the Father, the Father's power from the dead, we too might live and move in a new kind of existence. We have to be closely fitted into the pattern of his resurrection, as we've been in the pattern of his death. We have to be sure of this, that our former nature has been crucified with him and the living power of our guilt annihilated so that we are slaves of guilt no longer. Guilt makes no more claim on a man who's dead. And if we've died with Christ, we have faith to believe that we shall share his life. We know that Christ now has risen from the dead and cannot die any more. Death has no more power over him. The death he died was a death once for all to sin. The life he now lives is a life that looks forward towards God. You see, one of the purposes of baptism can be likened to the issuing of a death certificate of our past life, (coughs) that the old is finished. A person who believes on Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour and calls upon him to save them, to forgive them, 
to cleanse them and make them new, that's what happens. And the Bible speaks of those who believe in Jesus Christ and make him Lord. You know, I say make him Lord because the devil believes. It's not believing that's the, the answer. It's believing and the following on, making him Lord. And that person is being treated new, created new. The old past life has been finished. Like the man who laid in the dust, as far as everyone's concerned, he's dead. But he's alive. He's alive in a new life. How does this happen? Well, I've got five words I want to share with you. Very quickly. The first word is the word aspiration. We aspire to things. People aspire to know God. They're aware of the creator. They know that there's a God and there's a spiritual dimension. They know that there's more to life than that which they are experiencing. So... There's got to be something in us that aspires to finding the answer. People say to me, I have ne I've never come across God. Well, perhaps they've never been looking. You've got to have that aspiration in you. The second one is realisation. Realising that if what Jesus said is true, you know, C.S. Lewis said about him, he's either mad or he's bad or it's true. And it's what Jesus said is true. I need to be right with a holy God. Because I'm unholy. No one had to tell me that. When I aspired to find God, no one had to tell me that I was unholy. Believe you me. The life I lived and the various things. And you know the word for sin, what it means is missing the mark. And it's, it's I'm not being an athlete here, but firing the arrow and the arrow not arriving at the target. It misses the mark. It falls short. And we've all fallen short of God's holiness and righteousness. And the consequence of living for myself, not according to his way, is that I stand to be judged and condemned. So aspiration and realisation. The next one is substitution. That Jesus Christ took our place on the cross, bore our sin, and everything that separates, justice is satisfied. I've said this before, but if I went to prison, or if I had committed a crime, I went before the judge, and the judge said, are you guilty? And I said, I am. The judge can't say, it's my wife's birthday, I'm going to let you off. Or it's a nice sunny day, let's all go down the beach. When the law is broken, there must, have, there must be an answer to that. We can't get round it. But if someone else stood up and said, he's guilty and you're going to sentence him to five years in prison, I'll do it instead, I would walk out free and that person would go in my place. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He died on the cross for what we did. So aspiration, realisation, substitution. The next one is motivation. Why did God do it? Why? You know why? Because he loved us. Because he is a God of love. He didn't have to do it. Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. He chose to do it because he loved us. And he realised that we could do nothing about our situation, so he did it for us. And he did it because of love. So aspiration, realisation, substitution, motivation. And the last word is a, a word beloved of Christians. It's regeneration. It means to generate again. New lives for old. That's what God does. You know, years ago when I was growing up as a kid, you could have a man go around the streets with uh, either a van or even a horse and cart and they'd call out, that they'd, they'd give you a goldfish if you, if you gave them goods and various things. They, they, you know, many a man's suit has disappeared when a kid has taken it and got a goldfish for it. But they used to cry out these things about new for old. Well, that's what God does. It's new lives for old. He comes to do something. And this is what the baptism is about. 
It's dying to ourselves and rising into the new life of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's nothing to do with what happens to babies. It's all about what we do when we're conscious, we make a conscious decision to follow Jesus. I made a conscious decision in my late teens. I was a rock and roll drummer, fag smoking, beer swilling, non-Christian, knew nothing about God, and then God hit me one day. Well, I met some Christians, changed my life. New lives were old. And when I went into the waters of baptism, I was saying, Lord, I'm under new management. New management now. I'm following you. That's what I want to do. It's part of that process that I'm going to say I will be following Jesus as Lord forever, from now onwards. It's my intention by his power to live for him. Sometimes things don't always go right, but that's my intention. Just like the gunslinger, death meant an end to the old and a new beginning. He went out free with a release from his past. And that's the wonderful thing. And it's power over me. God breaks the power of sin over our lives. Isn't that exciting? You may get excited. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Baptism acknowledges the fact that this has occurred within me. So that's what we're going to see now. Okay. Let's just pray for a second. Father, we thank you for loving us and being gracious to us. We thank you that you've done what we couldn't do. You've dealt with the sin issue. You've dealt with our past. You've given us a bright future and a new future. And we come and we give you thanks and praise for all that you've done. And we pray this morning that for anyone who's hearing this for the first time, Lord, that you'd speak to their hearts. And show them the way forward. And show them your love, Lord, because you love them and care about them. And you've known them from before they were even created. That's what your word says. And you know every hair on their head. So bless them, Lord, and speak to them. And all, to all of us, Lord, we rejoice in what's going to happen today, Lord. In Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.